Um, as I considered what to say in my introductory remarks, my, my thoughts turned not only to 1917, uh, but also, as they have been doing too often, uh, to developments over the last couple of months. Uh, the current U.S. presidential administration's apparent shift in posture towards its European allies has challenged expectations about American leadership and even partnership that are at the center of my topic. It's impossible to believe, it's impossible to think that we would receive letters and characterizations <laughs> from Belgian, little or big Belgians, uh, uh, like that today. Um, German Chancellor Angela Merkel, for example, pointedly remarked in the wake of Donald Trump's recent meeting with NATO and G7 leaders that Europe, quote, really must take our fate into our own hands. Uh, that the days when Europe could rely on others was over to a certain extent. After the Trump administration announced its withdrawal from the Paris climate change agreement, as Jean-Michel said he should be here today in Saint-Nazaire, the French president, Emmanuel uh, Macron, made a direct appeal in English, uh, and his English is as good as he looks. Uh, you have a very young and handsome president. We have a very old and orange one. Um, he, he made his appeal in English, offering France as a second homeland to all scientists, engineers, entrepreneurs, responsible citizens who were disappointed by the decision of the United States. I can assure you, France will not give up the fight. Sounding a bit like Clemenceau for a moment. <laughs> The disappointment expressed in these comments stems from long-held expectations about American partnership and leadership vis-a-vis -vis Europe since the end of the Second World War. I want to go back to 1917, of course, and even a, a little earlier, in fact, and consider the relationship between Americans committed to reforming the international order and like-minded Europeans during the period of the Great War. Uh, specifically, I focus on the coterie of internationalists associated with the European Center of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, based in Paris and directed by the French senator and peace activist Paul Destournel de Constant, who expressed his own optimistic expectations about the potential for American leadership as early as 1906 when he predicted that the new world will create the new Europe. Examining the expectations shared by Destournel and others in his milieu, uh, for the United States over a period that spans the immediate pre-war American neutrality, its intervention in the immediate post-war uh, may provide some insights about the complicated dynamic that existed and perhaps continues to exist between Americans, Europeans, and efforts to build a peaceful world order. Narrowing things even further, most of my analysis focuses on the expectations expressed by French peace activists, especially Destournel. This is due not only to the uh, realities of the brief time a lot it to me. What? Is it working right there? So there's Desto now. Uh, and where we are, who you are and who I am, although these are indeed factors, but also by 1914, French peace activists had established a leading presence in what Jean-Michel Guieu has called a culture de paix, uh, evolving across the European continent and in the United States. So this peace culture advocated what by today's standards are modest measures towards reducing the likelihood of war, arbitration clauses as obligatory, uh, obligatory features of international treaties, the codification of international law adjudicated by an internationally recognized court, and a general but gradual reduction in armaments. Uh, it took some rightly deserved credit for the achievements of the Hague Peace Conferences of 1899 and 1907 as the rudiments of a peaceful world order, and this is simply a uh, timeline of important events in the course of the international and the French peace movements. Uh, it organized the Universal Peace Conferences nearly every year from 1889, which is a pivotal year in the history of modern, uh, the modern peace movement, whose attendees and agenda overlapped with the Interparliamentary Union, uh, an international caucus of like-minded legislators. In 1891, Bern became home to the International Peace Bureau with a mostly Swiss permanent secretariat, but also an executive committee whose members represented the various national peace movements. It prepared the agenda and pursued the resolutions of the Universal Peace Congresses, while also coordinating communication among national and local peace organizations. Over the course of a half a century, 
led especially by Frédéric Passy, a uh, co-recipient of the first Nobel Peace Prize, the French had built the most robust peace movement on the European continent. The Association de la Paix Palatois emerged as the preeminent peace society, owing in part to the quality of its journal La Paix Palatois, but numerous other peace societies also existed. They held their own national peace congresses intermittently after 1901 and drew support from many groups whose primary purpose was not arbitration and disarmament, but who sympathized with those aims, many of which, like Masonic Lodges, the Ligue des Droits de l'Homme, were closely uh, connected with the uh, radicals. Uh, a considerable percentage of the French peace movement's mem membership came from the middle and upper branches of law, academics, and commerce, and Destronel enlisted hundreds of his fellow legislators into a Groupe Parlementaire pour l'Arbitrage International, which Jean-Michel Guillaume has just published uh, an interesting uh, paper on. In short, these were not marginal figures lacking influence, and as Peter Jackson, Jackson's book Beyond the Balance of Power shows, I don't know with, whether Peter is here yet, he's, he's due here today, I believe, uh, his book shows that their ideas even found some resonance in the French foreign policy establishment. By 1914, uh, Destronel uh, and the leaders of the APD, uh, the APD, l'Association de la Paix pour le Droit, its president Théodore Ruissen, founding member and secretary Jules Proudhomme, and editor of La Paix pour le Droit, Jules Pouesh, and actually that's uh, Théodore Ruissen uh, at the top and uh, Jules Proudhomme uh, below him, um, had growing influence in the peace movement across Europe through their ties with the European Center of the Count Carnegie Endowment, and more to the, to the point, its disbursements, its money. Americans collaborated with Europeans in the Universal Peace Congresses and other venues of pro pacifist propaganda, but these interactions were limited by distance and also by inspiration, uh, much like pr uh, British peace activists. American Friends of Peace, Amis de la Paix, as they often called themselves, tended to emphasize the religious basis of their pacifism. And we heard from uh, Clotilde yesterday, who talked about the Quakers, the uh, La Société des Amis, and the, the Amis de la Paix, the um, Friends of Peace, sounded a bit too much like the Society of, of Friends to the more secular and worldly uh, peace activists for whom the considerations e of economics, law, politics, Kantian, more so than Christian matters, framed peace advocacy on the European continent. The founding of the Carnegie Endowment's European Center in 1911, however, marked a significant change in the kind of Americans who became engaged with the European peace movement and also uh, the extent of that involvement. It had an advisory council and a smaller executive council composed of legislators, diplomats, and other influential public figures. Uh, responsible, well-known Europeans selected by us, as they were described by Nicholas Murray Butler, uh, director of the endowments division that administered the European Center, and special correspondents scattered across the continent who kept the center informed of developments that called for intervention through the press or even through a high-profile commission of inquiry, like the one that investigated the origins and conduct of the Second Balkans War, which Nadine is such uh, an expert on. Uh, Carnegie created the endowment as a vehicle to disperse donations he had been giving for several years to various peace societies, mostly American peace societies. As for the trustees themselves, they embarked on a crusade to reorganize and integrate the European peace movement in pursuit of greater efficiency by specifically targeting funds towards the Interparliamentary Union, the International Peace Bureau and the Office Central des Associations Internationales, which was directed by the Belgian senator and pacifist Henri Lafontaine in Brussels. Butler proposed to shape the International Peace Bureau into, quote, the single agency for dealing with all matters that relate to the peace propaganda uh, to meet the trustees' standards of organizational efficiency, American uh, standards of organizational efficiency. Butler and Destronel had a, a close relationship, and um, in fact, if I go back for a moment, uh, Destronel had created an organization in 1905 called Conciliation Internationale, which in many ways was the predecessor to the European Center for the, the Carnegie Endowment, and even for the Carnegie Endowment itself. 
1907, an American branch of Conciliation Internationale was formed, the American Association for International Conciliation, uh, which had a very interesting relationship with the French branch. Carnegie uh, donated to the American branch, which then funneled money to the French branch. And so the, the branch was really financially supporting the, uh, the, the mother organization. So there was a very, was a very interesting and complicated dynamic between the Americans and the French, the, the Europeans, which also shows that these flows were not unidirectional. It was not Americans imposing their vision of uh, a peaceful world, world order on the Europeans, but the Europeans also had uh, some initiative in that, uh, in that relationship. In any case, so Butler and Dusternell had a very close relationship, um, which is also evidenced by the voluminous correspondence that Stefan and uh, Nadine will tell us about this, this afternoon, and they're bringing to a close uh, the um, publication of a substantial but still incomplete set of that correspondence that, that I'm looking forward to. Uh, but the clash of personalities, internal politics, and movement cultures that ensued quickly stymied this plan of the trustees and Butler. Butler said that nothing has disappointed me more in studying the movement for peace and arbitration than the small caliber and the extreme egotism and selfishness of many of those associated with the movement uh, in, he said in January 1913, uh, especially about La Fontaine, about which a few mom words in a moment. This is explained to me more adequately than anything else why the movement has made so little progress during the past 25 years. In consequence, the European Center became the institution the Carnegie Endowment favored to disperse its funds more selectively to those organizations and journals deemed worthy. The uh, International Peace Bureau and the Office Centrale were no longer uh, were no longer privileged, and it was through the European Center that this money flowed. The war erupted then, at a time when European peace activists believed that the infusion of American money could substantially advance their agenda, including a third Hague, Hague conference to make the duty to arbitration an obligation, and perhaps even a Société des Nations that Léon Bourgeois, among others, had envisioned since the Second Hague Conference. As Butler's remarks reveal, though, these high expectations were accompanied by resentments over decisions about how much the endowment should disperse and to whom. Henri Lafontaine is a case in point. His positions with the International Peace Bureau, the Office Centrale des Associations Internationales, the European Center's Advisory Committee, the Interparliamentary Union, and uh, on the Research Committee of the Endowments Division of Economics and History, he was a busy fellow, placed him in an advant advantageous position to benefit from the uh, endowment funds at multiple points. Yet he astonished Butler and other endowment administrators with insistent and emotional appeals for much larger sums. An excerpt from a letter to Butler in 1911 suggests what Lafontaine believed was at stake and how Americans could make a difference. Uh, no millionaire non pas soit suivi l'exemple des milliardaires américains. Il dépense beaucoup pour leurs collections privées, pour leur luxe personnel, et s'ils sont généreux, c'est aux œuvres de charité qu'ils donnent les préférences. C'est donc des États-Unis que doit nous venir l'aide attendue et des États-Unis sûrs. Ce n'est qu'aux États-Unis qu'une idée comme celle qui est à la Basse de notre œuvre peut être comprise. Le peuple américain est un peuple cosmopolite. Sa mission est de pacifier le monde. Je dirais volontiers de le civiliser. Ou, oh, sans fausse honte, je crois pouvoir dire que l'œuvre de l'Office central est un élément essentiel d'un tel effort civilisateur et que les plus grands sacrifices devraient être faits pour en assurer le succès. And here is an excerpt from an October 1914 letter to the Carnegie Endowment's president, Elihu Root, written in English by Lafontaine from his refuge in London that expresses the depths of his disappointment even as the traces of hopeful expectations remain. 
The whole effort of the Carnegie Endowment should have been directed to reinforce, by the largest aid possible, the work of the European peace societies. In my opinion, we shall be soon in the presence of a situation which will give the pacifists a unique occasion to crush militarism. But to obtain this result, the largest sums possible must be placed at the disposal of those who have to carry on this vital struggle. This from a Belgian in London during the war. If the Americans wish sincerely and truly to come to the rescue of Europe, to ensure its future intellectual and economic development, millions of dollars ought to be given and expended. Small subsidies are useless and absurd. I deem it my duty to point out very frankly that many are of opinion of a, that Americans of high standing would see, with some satisfaction, the decline of Europe in order to ensure to the United States the domination of the world. The most eloquent and persuasive proof that this is not the secret purpose of your countrymen would be to grant to the European peace movement the largest possible and most powerful support. This alone will give to the most suspicious the assurance that the United States is really a world power in the true sense of that expression working heartily and energetically in favor of the well-being of the whole world. La Fontaine traveled to the United States in 1915 for a speaking tour subsidized by the Carnegie Endowment, and he remained there in the United States throughout the war, lecturing on international law at City College in New York and elsewhere. So let's leave Fontaine, La Fontaine in the U.S. and uh, return to Europe. That's our Belgian connection today. <laughs> As for the circle of French peace activists from the APD, engaged with the Carnegie Endowment's European Center, they responded to the sudden onset of mobilization with an appeal to the Hague Conventions, as seen in this poster that appeared in the hundreds around Paris, sometimes alongside the posters announcing mobilization. They quickly resolved to support the war effort. Prudemo and Pouesh served in the army, among many others involved with the peace movement, as did, most, as did most pacifists in their respective belligerent countries, with the rationale that it would be that one last war to sweep away the reactionary forces of militarism and authoritarianism, what William Mulligan has called the Great War for Peace. Mm -hmm. Writing to Prudhomme, Puech, and Huissin in September 1914, Destronel asserted that the war must be fought to realize l'ouverture d'une ère nouvelle de Association des États pour la paix. The limitation des armaments. Sinon, le pays ne serait, ne serait qu'une trêve détestable, une aggravation. This naturally had implications for the Carnegie Endowment's relationship with its European center and for the attitude taken towards the neutral United States by French and other European pacifists whose countries were victims to what they denounced as German violations of international justice. On a practical level, Destornel and Butler agreed in October 1914 that the Paris office would cease dispersing endowment funds, although the trustees chose to continue subsidizing Le Pays par le Droit and the German peace movement's Journal de Friedensvarte directly from New York until 1917. On a principled level, however, the United States had to take sides in the global struggle for justice and peace, even as it maintained its military neutrality. In fact, its military tr neutrality could serve as an asset in that struggle, since a neutral United States retained the moral standing to broker a peace based on justice. The idea, and La Fontaine wrote and spoke about this in the United States, was that the moral pressure of those states that had signed the Hague Conventions but remained neutral uh, would uh, denounce, condemn the Germans <laughs> Leading, the German, leading Germany to be isolated, the German people to uh, be discontented, and that this would put pressure on the Germans to acquiesce uh, to a, a peace brokered on the principles of what, uh, what Destonel called conciliation. Um, so Destonel could chastise the American political leadership for its apparent, apparent indifference to German violations of international law and human rights, insisting qu'un grand pays comme les États-Unis peut et doit protester contre toute violation du droit des gens sans être pour cela obligé de déclarer la guerre au gouvernement coupable, et qu'un grand pays peut élever la voix sans montrer le point. 
He could also praise the United States, writing to Butler in October 1914, La conciliation in Europe a fait naufrage. Elle se réfugie aux États-Unis. Le nouveau monde sera son hoche de Noah. He clarified his meaning in less biblical terms in a letter to Butler a month later. Les conventions de la, de la haie. Uh, Ont-elles des actes sérieux ou une comédie? La consécration en un mot ou le scandaleuse et irrémédiable faillite du droit? Les conventions de la haie ont été signées par 44 États, par les États neutres comme par les, comme par les belligérants. Elle devrait être la garantie de tout, le devoir des neutres comme leur intérêt, et de continuer à y croire, de ne pas s'en détacher eux aussi. Ce serait surtout le devoir et le rôle des États-Unis, après le grand parc que leurs représentants ont pris à l'élaboration de ces conventions. Despite this rhetoric valorizing its military neutrality, the U.S. entry into the war was readily welcomed as making it truly war for liberty and justice against violence and military despotism. And now it only remains for us to win in such a way as to make a war like this the last to bring shame and suffering to humanity, Destinel wrote to uh, Butler. Theodore Ruissen remarked in Le Papal Adroit that Woodrow Wilson's statements about the war's ultimate purpose and outcomes echoed the peace movement's own pre-war goals. Although Destonel and others took some issue with the phrase, peace without victory, that Wilson used in his famous speech of January 1917, I think they would have been more comfortable with the phrase, peace without conquest, uh, which had a different connotation. Uh, for Destonel and the other European peace activists, a, mil a military defeat of Germany was necessary for a post-war peace of conciliation to be necessary, for the Société des Nations uh, to be constructed. So uh, it's not peace without victory, but peace without conquest, the rights of conquest. Um, as Destonel observed to Butler, une paix sans victoire ne serait pas la paix. American entry into the war was accompanied by a wave of activism in France in support of the Société des Nations, and uh, Carl's first book <laughs> was about this, and uh, Jean-Michel Guieu has written about this, and this reflected a renewed vigor among the pacifists and the growing number of others who now identified with their objectives and I believe was directly related to uh, the American direct intervention in, in the war, the peace telegram, and, uh, et cetera. On November 12, 1918, Destonel dispatched a telegram to President Wilson that read, La démocratie française n'oubliera jamais ce qu'elle doit au généreux concours américain et de votre décisive intervention pour la victoire du droit des peuples sur la pression de l'autocratie. Since 1914, Destonel had linked the conflict with the revolutionary struggle and its ideals at the heart of the Republican political heritage shared by the U.S. and France alike. As he wrote to Butler back then in September 1914, ces idées sont la vraie source des plus nobles efforts humains. Elles ont été la source de la Révolution française comme de la Révolution américaine. And the expectation was that the war's end was the beginning of a new stage in this struggle in which the two great republics would work together Fidèle à notre foi, à notre esprit de conciliation, incompatible, uh, incomp incompatible avec l'esprit de conquête. This agreement over the endowment's priorities in Europe resumed between the American trustees and the European associates, however. Europeans expected that efforts and resources would be disposed towards strengthening the League of Nations. Several of them became deeply involved in the League itself or organizations that supported and promoted it. Prudemont became Secretary General of the Association Française pour la Société des Nations, the uh, AFSN, which shared office space and personnel with the European Center from 1918 to 1919. And as we know, the U.S. Senate refused to ratify the Treaty of Versailles, which kept it from joining the League of Nations. And this led Butler, during a trip he made uh, to Paris to visit the European Center in 1921 to explain to its advisory council that subsidizing organizations like the uh, FSN risked harming the endowment, which might be accused of acting against U.S. policy in an American political environment 
passionately animated by the issue. So no longer would these disbursements go to organizations that sought to advance the credibility, the strength of the Société des Nations, which had become the League of Na Nations, uh, something altogether different than the conception that Léon Bourgeois and other European peace activists had in mind. Uh, instead, the trustees preferred projects characterized as, quote, so specific and so concrete, literally, as to serve in after years as itself a monument to and evidence of the interest of this endowment and of the American people through the endowment. It did so by committing large sums to rebuilding libraries in Louvain, Rheims, Belgrade, and funding the reconstruction of the French village of Fagnier. Brissin expressed the frustrated disappointment shared with many of his European pacifist colleagues who recognized the distinction between Europe's physical reconstruction and a revolutionary transformation of international relations. A philosophy professor, Brissin admitted to Destonel that millions of francs spent to rebuild a library ruined by war was most certainly laudable, but, and this rhetorical question is pointed enough to close my remarks, à quoi bon si une autre guerre vient demain incendier la bibliothèque toute neuve. Mm. 